Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our community, our impact. I'm Ann Mazer, CEO of Every Mind. Uh, today, we're thrilled to acknowledge and celebrate uh, the impact that we've had empowering our communities to reach optimal mental wellness for 66 years. I hope that intro music got you in the mood. Um, we're looking forward to the program. And I want to first, um, it is my honor to introduce a man who is not only a distinguished public servant, but also a strong advocate for mental health, Congressman Jamie Raskin, representing Maryland's 8th Congressional District, which encompasses the majority of Montgomery County and a small portion of Prince George's County. Congressman Raskin has devoted his life to service, tirelessly working to uplift every member of our community. Having been sworn into the fourth term at the start of the 118th Congress on January 6, 2023, Representative Raskin has demonstrated unwavering dedication to the causes that matter most to our people he represents. Chosen by the Democratic Caucus to be the ranking member of the House Committee on Oversight and Accountability, Representative Raskin's work spans several pivotal legislative landmarks, including marriage equality, the abolition of the death penalty, and the first benefit corporation law in America. Beyond his work in Congress, Representative Raskin has a storied academic career as a professor of constitutional law at American University's Washington College of Law for over 25 years. He has also authored several influential books, among them, the Washington Post bestseller, Overruling Democracy, The Supreme Court versus the American People, the widely acclaimed We the Students Supreme Court Cases for and About America's Students, and the New York Times number one bestseller, Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. Congressman Raskin is an outstanding example of dedication, resilience, and advocacy. Today, we are grateful this opportunity to have him share his insights and inspire us with his opening remarks for Every Mind's celebration of impact. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Congressman Jamie Raskin. Well, <clears throat> hello to Anne and hello to all my friends out with Every Mind. Um, congratulations on another successful year serving Maryland and people all across our region uh, as we approach the holiday season. I am always and forever grateful to you for the compassionate and uh, indispensable work you do in the community. And I want to salute your hardworking staff and your volunteers and everybody in the Every Mind community. Um, you guys know better than I do uh, how serious the emotional and mental health crisis is in America. The Surgeon General has declared there to be a uh, a national crisis in youth mental health in the country. Um, and you guys are very much on the front lines of trying to address the problems that manifest every day in a thousand different ways in our community. Um, you know, the authoritarian societies on earth, the authoritarian politicians and parties and movements, which are on the march, don't care about uh, the mental health of the people. Um, if anything, the mental health of the people is a threat to the tyrants like Vladimir Putin or Viktor Orban or President Xi or Marcos. Um, it's the democratic societies that believe in mental health and the physical health of the people because um, if we're gonna be a self-governing democratic society, we need everybody operating at their absolute best. And the mental health and the physical health of the people isn't a threat to the rulers. It's the basis for how we operate. Um, and I appreciate the fact that every mind is out there with the emphasis on every mind and every heart and every person, every human being. So uh, each of us is able to overcome the anxieties and the stresses of the moment that we live in. And um, attain to our best selves and our best work. Um, so the young people of today are 
um, stressed out about a lot of things in addition to whatever they're going on in their own lives and their own minds. They worry about climate change and whether it's ethical to bring children into a world with um, so many uh, weather related cataclysms that we're facing like record drought, record flooding, ocean level rise and all of the attendant complications of climate change, all of the political polarization, the rise of racism and anti-Semitism and authoritarianism, um, all of these things bear down on young people just as COVID-19 did. And that was a period of profound isolation and demoralization for the young. So we need politically, socially, culturally to be addressing and destigmatizing uh, mental health problems. And I, again, I want to praise you for everything you've done to empower people to talk about uh, mental illness and to talk about the fact that everybody uh, needs to be paying attention to his or her uh, mental health. Um, I've been working to try to build up the nation's mental health care infrastructure. Um, you know, the 988 Implementation Act is something I worked on with a handful of my colleagues to get more funding into the lifeline work of the 988 Implementation Crisis Line so that we have um, a robust first responder community all over America ready to leap into action when somebody contacts the new, um, the new 988 line. Um, I've been working on the Mental Health Professionals Workforce Shortage Loan Repayment Act, which would allow for repayment of up to $250,000 in eligible student loans for people who enter the mental health profession and are engaged in meeting um, the crisis deficit of mental health professionals that we're seeing around the country. And I've also been working um, to advance the pediatric mental health care access program, which is a way to back up primary care uh, pediatricians and doctors with mental health experts who are able to uh, help them understand what they're facing in patients and uh, address their problems with the best possible uh, mixture of uh, medication, uh, counseling, and different kinds of uh, social therapy that may be out there. So um, look, we all have a lot to do, but we're doing it together. Um, I wanna thank all of the attendees and the panelists for your work implementing the 98 Lifeline, which has nationally received um, nearly 7 million calls and texts and chats since it was launched um, in the summer of 2022. Um, and I wanna celebrate the expansion of the school and community-based youth services, um, further supported by funding from the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act to reach more young people in Montgomery County uh, and across the state of Maryland as we confront the youth mental health, health crisis. Um, and um, I want to just commend you on your determination that, that no young person should suffer or struggle alone with their mental health challenges. Um, we all are gonna do this together and we're gonna get everybody through it. Um, while government resources are essential to meeting all of the urgent clinical needs out there, it's equally important that all of us participate on a volunteer basis, on a community and social basis to provide support and words of encouragement and comfort for one another. So thanks to all of you, thanks to the mental health care providers, the advocates, the nurses, the doctors who are doing this work every single day. And above all, thank you, every mind, for continuing to serve the people of Maryland uh, with such compassion and such vision uh, at a very tough time. And I wish you all the happiest holidays. Thank you so much, Representative Raskin. Um, you absolutely highlighted the fact that, and the reminder for all of us, how important it is to talk about our own experiences and journey. And um, we're always so grateful for the partnership with 
uh, you and your team and um, hearing about uh, some of the legislation that has been accomplished and what's to come is so important. And again, the message that it takes all of us uh, to come together and ensure that we're um, talking about our experiences and coming together to support each other. Um, thank you again. Uh, appreciate your partnership and your commitment to mental health here in our community and across the state of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. All best. Thank you. So we have an exciting program. Um, again, a big thanks to uh, Congressman Raskin for kicking us off. He is such a champion in this space and we're so grateful for all the work that he's doing um, in his part. Um, today, we're going to uh, start with a brief video that spotlights the impact that we've had with uh, all of your support and partnership. I'll also share a brief plan for the road ahead that every mind sees um, for our vision and goals as we uh, hope to accomplish over this next year. And then we are privileged to have an outstanding panel of frontline staff who are the backbone of service delivery here at Every Mind. They'll share their experiences and provide perspectives that illuminate the challenges and the victories that um, they see every day. Throughout the event, we'll animate your experience, have a little fun uh, with an interactive mentee polls. So be ready to engage in that. After the panel, there will be a live Q&A. Uh, this is your opportunity to ask questions, engage with us, share your thoughts, explore different perspectives. So we really hope that you'll engage with that and we welcome you to do so. Now, the following video exemplifies our commitment to mental wellness in our community which was amplified this year. From the launch of 988, as Congressman Raskin spoke, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, to the expansion of youth services and innovative programs supporting adults. The video spotlights our accomplishments driven by the support that you all so graciously provided. So please enjoy our community, our impact, the Every Mind Impact Celebration 2023. Every Mind is proud to present our 2023 Impact Report, an overview of our accomplishments over the past year. Your support makes it possible for us to provide essential mental wellness services to our communities. This year, we launched the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which connects individuals in crisis to behavioral health services nationwide. This lifeline fills a major need in our community and has become a vital resource for many. In response to this new service, we saw a tenfold increase in people reaching out for help via text, with nearly half of them being young people. Every Mind is working to break down the barriers, preventing our youth from getting access to the support they need. We intensified our commitment to suicide prevention for service members, veterans, and their families. We have screened over 100 individuals to assess their risk of suicide and have identified mental health services as one of the top five needs for this group. Every Mind created an innovative diversion program to support adults on the brink of homelessness. This year, we built the program's foundation, ensuring that people maintain their homes, reducing negative physical and mental consequences while fostering resilience and well-being. We expanded school and community-based services by 115%. We are now able to provide counseling and support to even more young people and their families. Our educational trainings, including mental health first aid, helped empower over 6,100 individuals in navigating their mental health crises in their personal and professional lives. The impact we've made over the past year would not have been possible without the continued support of our donors, volunteers, and supporters. Thank you for all you do to help strengthen our communities and empower individuals to reach optimal mental wellness. Wow, it's so powerful um, to see everything we've been able to accomplish this past year. Um, I want to first and foremost thank our partners and supporters. I want to express my deepest gratitude as you have made all this impact possible. Uh, your commitment to our mission has been instrumental in achieving these milestones. So, so grateful for the partnership. And as uh, Congressman Raskin mentioned, we need to continue that partnership. We all need to work together to move forward. 
As we think about the year ahead, um, we remain resolved in our pledge to enhance our impact even further. We anticipate a year filled with strengthening our existing initiatives, creating new partnerships with all of you, and innovating solutions for our community's most urgent needs. One such initiative involves br bridging the gap in middle school mental health services. Uh, together with our partners in education, we aim to bring much needed resources to this critical age group, fostering, fostering early intervention and boosting resilience. The middle school, there's a, a dearth of services and we're looking forward to really focus and come together with partners to meet the need that is there with the middle schools. Also concurrently, we'll be focusing on refining our adult focused services recognizing all the social determinants as vital elements of mental health and emphasizing the importance of holistic care. As we further solidify our 988 infrastructure, we will augment our partnership to increase our role as a national backup center for text and chat services. In our pursuit for transformation, we'll continue to broaden every mind's impact through our evidence-based trainings, veteran service coordination, and vigorous advocacy efforts. And we will stand firm in sustaining our commitment to prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. These initiatives within our organization is the principle that underpins our ability to present sensitive and impactful services to every member of our community. We look forward with partnering with you on these initiatives in the year to come. So now, before moving forward into our panel discussion, um, we uh, up on your screen is um, a QR code for you to access uh, Menti, and you can either scan the QR code or you can type menti.com and enter the numbers that you see on the screen, 3823-5584. And um, once you're in, we are going to um, go ahead and I think go ahead and do our first poll. So as you can see, what is the first word that comes to your mind when you think about mental wellness? Again, you can scan the QR code or go to menti.com and plug in the number. And I invite everyone to participate so that we can get um, little interactive here and want to hear what's on your mind as you think about mental wellness. Um, what, what first comes to mind for you? I think all kinds of great pieces. Um, this word cloud that is, is coming together, everything from emotion, stigma, anxiety, and right. Some of those things that, uh, we're all dealing with at different points in our life. And I love the fact that some of these that are really coming um, through strong and the larger print are those responses that are, are getting um, many people, um, you know, putting that as the first thing that they think about. So I'm seeing peace and resiliency and um, therapy and hope, um, which is really wonderful, right? We have everything from those uh, daily concerns that we're all dealing with. And then I see a lot of thing around support and self-care and hope and resiliency and health and joy. Um, and so that's where we we really wanna be and, and all of us coming together is gonna help us get there. So thank you. That was our first test with the mentee. You're gonna have an opportunity later on in the program um, during the Q&A session to engage some more. Um, Continue your, feel free to keep putting um, anything that comes to mind for you um, in there. And we appreciate that. Okay, so now um, we are going to move into our panel discussion. Um, it's my um, honor actually to introduce my colleagues here at Every Mind and the Every Mind team. And joining them to facilitate the discussion is our Chief Program Officer, Karishma Shep, who brings her leadership to the team and the organization every day. And I wanna thank you once again for joining us for the celebration. Your, your participation and commitment um, is just so critically important as we all come together to support every member of our community um, and their mental health every day. 
thank you so much. And um, going to pass it over to Karishma and my colleagues and enjoy the conversation and be sure to um, participate in the Q&A following. Thank you so much, Anne, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so proud to lead this segment um, of our impact webinar today by presenting and introducing my colleagues, our amazing panelists um, who are here with us this afternoon, who are gonna share their experiences working on the ground and embedded in our community. So let's go ahead and start with introductions as the uh, faces start popping up on our screens. So first I wanna start with, uh, with Will. Hi, uh, my name is Will Moore Ramos. I've been on the hotline team uh, for a little over a year now as a supervisor. And I'm uh, I'm super excited to be a part of this panel today. Great, thanks so much, Will, and welcome. And now, um, Ellie. Hi, everyone. My name is Ellie Mercadante, and I'm an education coordinator with our education team. I've been here for about two years now, uh, and I'm also very excited to be a part of this panel. Excellent. Welcome, Ellie and Mariana. Hello, everyone. My name is Mariana Carvo, and the, and I'm the senior child and family therapist with Lincoln Just Learning. Um, I've been with Every Mind for about, oh my goodness, 11 years now almost, mm -hmm. um, and I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Welcome, Mariana, and congrats on 11 years. Uh, and Jimmy. Thanks, Krishma. Um, my name is Jimmy Slattery. I'm the manager of the Centralized Intake and Diversion Program um, that just started this year, and so did I. I am also <laughs> excited to be here. Great. Thanks, Jimmy. And last but certainly not least, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Amy Stoddard. I am the Northern Virginia Regional Manager for Serving Together. And what makes us unique is we help focus on our veterans, service members, and their families by connecting them to resources in the community. So it's really great to be here. I've been part of the team for three years now. Thanks so much, everyone. It's so great to have you all together this afternoon. Um, so we're gonna just dive right in and start with our questions. Um, so the first question is for Will. So Will, as Congressman Raskin has stated, this past year, we really strengthened our foundation as a call center to respond to the increase in demand that we've experienced with the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. So can you tell our audience a little bit about how the launch of 988, which is an easy to remember three digit number has impacted the number of people reaching out to us, especially youth. Um, and what trends have you observed since the launch of 988 um, in July of 22? Sure. So uh, regarding youth specifically and the 988 service, which we also call the lifeline, um, we are finding that youth are, are, are they, they find the service very meaningful and impactful for them. Uh, and we know this because they're reaching out. Uh, we're even seeing children as young as nine and 10 years old reaching out, which to me is yeah. just absolutely mind boggling. Um, the first time mm -hmm. I encountered that, I was just, just utterly surprised. Um, but I think what that shows is not only the need, but it also shows, I think, that the school systems are starting to advertise to the students uh, the existence of the 98 mm -hmm. service. And um, they're talking about to the students about the importance of, of mental health. So um that's 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 great, and we need we definitely need some more of that. Um, one interesting trend that we're seeing with the youth reaching out, um, which is uh, not an unexpected one, but what we're seeing is that um, uh, youth are reaching out, and how they're reaching out is interesting. There are three ways you anyone can reach out to nine eight eight by phone, by chat, and by text, uh, and we're finding that uh, a lot of youth um, reach out by by chat and text platforms. They seem to be comfortable with that versus the phones. And this is such a reality that um, as some data reports showed that as high as 75% of all chatters and texters to the 988 Lifeline are 24 years of age and younger. So yes, youth are finding this meaningful. They're reaching out and are reaching out by chat and text primarily. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Will. And, you know, it's so, while it's terrifying that youth so young are reaching out to us. It's also reassuring that they are reaching out, that they know that something's not right with them and that they need to talk to somebody about it. So how incredible that, you know, as we continue to work towards reducing stigma around talking about mental illness and about mental health and wellness, that our young people are reaching out more and more. Um, so building on that, Will, could you share some inspiring stories of resilience um, and hope that you've heard on Lifeline this past year? Yeah. Uh, I'd love to share a story. There, there are many. 
what mm -hmm. what comes to mind right now is a, is a 12 year old uh, texter that came on recently. Um, and this was a very challenging interaction because she came on and it was, um, it was as if she wasn't wanting to get help. Uh, and actually we see this, this irony play out often with many visitors on a lifeline where people come out um, reaching out for support and for help. But at the same time, because of their deep level of hopelessness and despair, um, there's also a resistance to help and a resistance to being, you know, to, to efforts to stay safe. And that was certainly the case with this, this young, young texter. So she was in her bedroom and um, she reached out to us by text and she was just saying she was, she was done with life. She no longer wanted to live. Uh, life was tough and she, she wanted to die and she wanted to kill herself that night. So we, we tried many strategies. We, we tried many different things. And we kept hitting the same kind of um, uh, roadblock where, where she kind of was like, no, no, no. To everything we tried doing, no, no, no. I, I don't want to stay safe. I want to die. And so we we decided to take a different approach with her where um, even though at a moment's notice, we were ready to kind of intervene more strongly if necessary, we we decided to acknowledge that she didn't come on to to the, to the interaction to talk about safety. She came on to talk about how much life sucked for her. And so we decided to give her that space to, to just share, like what, what was going on? We'd, we asked different questions. What's going on? What has brought you to this point? What's going on in your life right now that is so, you know, um, that is no, so bad for you right now? And um, so giving her that space to share, by the end of that conversation, by the end of that interacting, something pretty amazing happened. She told us, I'm going to go to sleep. And um, that might seem small or insignificant, but considering that she had been so strongly saying she wanted to die, for her to then shift to saying, I'm gonna to go to bed now, was a huge victory, okay? That, to me, that's, for that little girl, that was a victory. And I find that super inspiring because I think it shows a young person who is, who is willing to just kind of commit one more day to face a challenge and a pain of, an, uh, of life one more day because of the conversation she, she had with us. And um, and really, I, I kind of, uh, I think that could be any of us on the other side of the line. And um, we can all relate to that at some level, I think. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Will, for sharing that incredibly powerful story, which is really possible because of the 24-7 support that's available through 988 um, for those of us that might not have any other outlet or support, right? And so... Um, thank you, Will. So my next question is going to be for Ellie. So Ellie, you know, as you know, and you've been leading these efforts, another priority for us this past year was making our evidence-based trainings much more accessible um, to our community to really help to bridge the gap in the shortage of mental health professionals um, that not only exist in our community, but really across our country. And so thinking about creative ways that we can support our community while there continues to be a mental health professional shortage, can you tell us about what evidence-based courses you have found to be most effective enabling in enabling people to navigate mental health crises. Of course, thank you. So our education team um, has had the honor of being awarded the FY21 Mental Health Awareness Trainings Grant from SAMHSA, so the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services for Services Administration. Um, we've just begun our third year with this funding. And so this allows us to provide free adult mental health first aid and QPR. So that stands for question, persuade, refer uh, for any healthcare or behavioral health professional. So this includes your nurses, your doctors, your front desk workers, volunteers, students who are studying to become a mental health professional or, or not even mental health, just healthcare professional, um, anyone really who is going to be front facing with the community. And so these evidence-based trainings, you know, you can kind of hear how they mirror basic first aid or CPR within the name. So that's done on purpose. And so these trainings are to help, you know, build skills to, you know, recognize signs and symptoms of a mental health challenge, how to um, you know, understand how to provide support, you know, how to find and utilize mental health resources like some of the ones that, you know, my wonderful fellow panelists offer and we'll talk about. And so um, it's really great to be able to use in either a crisis or non-crisis situation and it helps to destigmatize those conversations surrounding mental health and suicide. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Ellie. And, you know, trainings like mental health first aid and QPR are so vital for everyone in our community 
to, to take because, you know, as I mentioned, there is a mental health workforce shortage. And so by all of us learning the signs and symptoms of mental illness, as well as valuable resources like, like 988, we're going to be able to support a loved one, a colleague, a friend, you know, during a mental health challenge or a crisis. So it's it's such important training for all of us to take. So thank you for sharing more on that, Ellie. Um, now I want to excuse me, transition over to Mariana. So um, one of our other areas of focus this past year has been increasing the reach of our school-based programming and services. So as we've been able to have more therapists expand into more schools than in previous years, what do you think has been the most significant outcome of being able to provide therapy to youth and their families? All right. So a significant outcome that we have seen in school-based services um, that is that we were able to serve more than 9,000 families and students. Mm -hmm. um, we have expanded the number of schools that we're directly serving. Um, and now we have teams at 18 different schools providing therapy, not only therapy, but case management as well. Um, there has also been an expansion um, in the number of community locations so that we can um, have more services be more accessible, mm -hmm. um, both in person and in telehealth. Um, you know, this has given the opportunity for many of those that have been on many, many wait lists to be seen yeah. for counseling and are able to get the support that, it, you know, that is needed. Um, and, you know, and within school-based services, there's always going to be many, many successes as well. Um, and I would love to talk about one of them and one of them being a client um, about um, her opening up and having the ability to communicate more verbally in therapy. Um, this specific client was very, very quiet during um, sessions and only communicated non-verbally, sometimes just using thumbs up or thumbs down or kind mm -hmm. of just shaking her head. Um, but, you know, by continuing to build the rapport and trust, incorporating different techniques, you know, she began um, being more communicative um, in sessions, began talking more about her feelings, her friendships, um, school and home life. Um, she became more verbally engaged in all the different activities that were provided in sessions. Um, so this is not only like one of the successes that we've had, but, you know, one of many. Um, and we are going to continue to see them every day. Great. Thank you so much, Mariana. And, you know, you speak, it's so true, especially with our young people, but across the board, we find that, you know, talking about mental health and what's going on here um, and what you're feeling here, it can be so hard. And so to even as Will was saying, right, that building that trust, that rapport and engaging in different creative ways to be able to allow for that space to meet our clients where they are so that they can open up is so critical. Um, and that client and therapist relationship takes time to build um, so that it's so great to see the results when it happens, um, because we know that having one trusted adult in a child's life is the most impactful protective factor to support their own men their mental health and wellness. So um, now I want to shift um, to to Jimmy and uh, Jimmy. When we consider adults in our community, one of the other areas that we've expanded this past year, which you mentioned in your introduction, has been through our innovative diversion program, where we're preventing adults and then families with adult children from becoming homeless. So, can you give us some insight into the journey of individuals who are successfully transitioning from the brink of homelessness to a place of stability and resilience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the main goal of the diversion program is to help try to end homelessness before it even starts. So we work with people who are facing imminent homelessness, um, facing eviction or displacement from their homes. Um, as the diversion team, we have a lot of tools at our disposal, uh, whether it is grants or mediation skills um, and other funding that we can provide for people. Uh, we have connections throughout the county as well. Um, and, you know, I, I have a story in mind, um, because it just came to fruition uh, at the end of last week. Um, mm -hmm. but I had been assigned a client and I had been working with this client, um, and they had been living with their mother after the client had experienced a pretty serious medical emergency. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was the mother's apartment and the mother passed away. Um, and so the apartment was then being repossessed and my client found themselves, facing homelessness. Um, as I as I mentioned, there was a, a pretty significant medical emergency that the client had experienced, and they were unable to navigate public transportation on their own. They were unable to get food on their own. Um, and I was able to connect with this person via telephone and do most of the work that we did via phone. Um, I had a long conversation trying to explore different options, different supports that existed. 
And through um, that conversation discovered that the client had an estranged daughter uh, that they had not spoken to in, in a couple of years. Um, and through some motivational interviewing and some, some questions and poking and prodding, we agreed to call the daughter, um, had a nice hour long conversation on conference call and the daughter agreed to house this client um, short term until we could find more secure housing. Um, I continue to work with this client and we we're able to secure an apartment. Um, we we're able to find other programs within the county as well to help offset the cost of rent and things like that. Um, and uh, just this week, um, the client picked, well, his daughter picked up the checks for the apartment to move in um, and now finds himself with his own place, roof over his head for the next 12 months. It's amazing. That's amazing, Jimmy. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And, you know, the work that you and our diversion team are doing is so critical because housing is healthcare, and we know that. And helping people to maintain their stable housing or, or finding stable housing, if that's the case, strengthens mental wellness, right? And it's all connected. So um, another question I wanted to ask you, Jimmy, um, as both Mariana and uh, Will talked about, the time that it takes to build trust and rapport, right, with children and youth, whether it's on the hotline, Line, whether it's in a therapeutic relationship, we know that working with homeless individuals or those on the brink of homelessness also requires a lot of trust building. And I know you alluded to that in, in, in some of your comments just now. But what do you want, what do you wish that our audience knows about how working with homeless individuals is different from traditional case management services? Uh, sure. You know, the way I, I, I explain it to new staff that come onto the team is to remember that anyone coming in for diversion services is 100% in crisis mode. Um, we have clients that are referred to us that have a week before they're evicted. We have clients that walk in with a trash bag on their back with all their worldly belongings, a, a face full of shame and eyes full of fear. And we need to step in build fast rapport, build fast trust, and, and carry, as it's been mentioned a couple of times already today, we need to carry hope. We need to be there and show the the, the clients that we get that there is hope. Um, okay. It does take uh, very quick rapport building on our end. Um, we have cases that open and close within a week. Um, mm -hmm. And so there is a challenge there for us and and as with in you know early childhood development and as as with uh, you know the 98 hotline the earlier we intervene the better um the yeah, sooner that absolutely. we can get to meet with someone the better um and so you know to the community at large I, I am always trying to get the word out about what our program is and what we do because if we have three weeks to work with someone we have a much better chance of of keeping them from experiencing homelessness than if we have three hours it's not impossible at three hours, but it is a lot more work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Jimmy, for sharing Thanks, your, your experience. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to transition now to Amy. So Amy, last year, uh, we increased our effic efforts, excuse me, to prevent suicide among service members, veterans, and their families. And um, I know we conducted about 100 screenings for risk of suicide amongst our service member, veteran, and um, family population um, over this past year. So how do mental health services rank among the top five needs for our service members, veterans, and their veterans and their families. Tell us more about that trend. Absolutely. So surprisingly, right now, mental health services actually rank number three among mm -hmm. our top five means of our veteran and military community. Um, recently, our team has implemented very specific suicide prevention screening tools to our intake process. Um, and we've actually identified that number one, when a client calls, they may not even recognize or make that connection that they're actually struggling with a mental health right. um, condition at the time. Um, and so that becomes one of the first things we recognize. Number two is we know that due to the stigma that continues to be around mental health, that sometimes it takes a little bit of time to be able to, when, they, when they're calling in for services, that may not be their initial request. Um, but we also know that as we, and we've been talking about a lot of this, that connection, that relationship, that rapport, that through our intake process of getting to know the client and built and establishing that relationship, we're really able to ask the right questions 
that help that individual to feel safe to be able to share that, you know what, I may need additional services. Um, and, and, and that's the platform that we use to be able to really connect with them. Um, we also know in regards to that top five needs um, that actually number one is housing needs, mm -hmm. emergency, financial assistance, um, and food insecurity, as well as employment. And we know that that's the umbrella, right? They're calling in for those needs, but mental health is all impacted by those very high pressure needs of our community. Um, and we know that that has a significant effect on the mental wellness. Um, so these specific needs that are happening, you know, they're increasing those um, individuals who are suffering with depression and anxiety. Maybe some have never just due to the pressures of life they are now. Um, and so really being able to um, identify those needs and it's really basic needs, right? People are having to decide, do I put food on the table? Do I pay my rent and my mortgage or my utilities, right? That's heavy <laughs> pressures of life. And that has a significant impact on the mental wellness of our military community, along with their life of service, right? So all those contributing factors really have a major impact into um, our community as a military active veteran and the family members and our caregivers. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Amy. And, you know, you're so right. As, as our services span, um, you know, such a broad spectrum and array, thinking about how prevention and that early intervention is so critical so that we prevent people from falling into deeper crises. So supporting them with their housing, you know, to your point and to Jimmy's point, to ensuring that they have food in their stomachs, right, that they have gainful employment, um, that is all supporting and strengthening mental wellness, right, and preventing crises. So, and then we know that, um, unfortunately, crises are inevitable um, as well. And suicide prevention is so critical for our military and veteran community. So I want to pose another question for you, Amy. What do you envision for the future of mental health services and support? And how do you see Every Mind's mission really aligning with this vision? Yes, and this is such a great question. So mental health is evolving, right? Um, and, and there's many different ways, but the very first thing that needs to be addressed is treatment really needs to be accessible and affordable to all. That has to be an inclusive process of treatment that we really have to focus on. We also know like with technology and other ways, um, telehealth services are becoming more and more available to clients and that's really important. Um, we know that just with the click of a fingertip that you can receive services, and that's really important for those individuals who do want the, um, you know, that virtual component versus the one-on-one -on -one face to face. Um, we also know that um, AI is actually becoming a great, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, support system in in mental health in regards to diagnosis, creating treatment plans. Um, and, and being able to have accessibility to all of these is really going to be beneficial. Um, but of course, every mind continues to address these vast and growing mental health needs of our clients across the spectrum. Um, and again, and, and uh, Will gave a great example, right? At our crisis line, we're providing opportunities for um, talk, chat, and text, right? Mm -hmm. our, our youth are able to reach out um, and, and get to someone who they feel comfortable to share what they're experiencing. And then our military and veteran community, they can reach out to us. Again, we're using technology as a tool. Um, they can go on our website and click get assistance now, or they can actually just pick up a phone and speak directly to an individual, our care coordinators, who do an amazing job every day connecting with our community and building that relationship. Um, so again, every mind again is the leader in providing that connection our education, the advocacy, and of course, most importantly, direct services to the entire DMV region. Absolutely. I love that. And you're so right, Amy, right? I mean, we are constantly evolving as an organization to ensure that our services and our programs and, and the support and resources that we can provide are meeting the clients in the community where they are, right? Ensuring accessibility, um, whether that's, you know, supporting with transportation barriers, um, telehealth, right? Whatever it might be, it's so critical. Um, and we've really been able to do that and, and, and focus in, um, in being able to shift and adapt and pivot, you know, to ensure that we're meeting our clients' needs as they continue to grow um, in this post 
COVID world. Um, so thank you so much. So another question, Ellie, I want to turn back to you. Um, and as we think about new partnerships and innovations in the year to come, what are you looking forward to implementing to really help to meet the emerging and urgent mental health needs of our communities in the future? Of course. So yes, yeah, so one of uh, our education department's biggest goals is to encourage partnerships um, that promote health equity so that we can meet the needs of our community. And so uh, one of our most significant partnerships so far has been with Care First Health System, you know, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so we conduct multiple trainings a month. Um, you know, in our efforts to train up all of their staff. So, so far we've been able to train over 800 of their employees um, in mental health first aid so far. And so this ranges, you know, from staff to, uh, you know, their volunteers. And so they in turn also help us to promote these trainings to their external partners. So we've been able to reach organizations like LifeBridge Health, Maryland Coalition of Families, Volunteers of America. So all of these organizations in the national capital region, which take up most of the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, um, you know, that we might not have been able to be exposed to before. And so our team also has other funding opportunities outside of SAMHSA. So we've got um, funding that helps us provide free adult and youth mental health first aid to members of our Montgomery County community, um, as well as any other opportunities. And so this allows us to build relationships with all of you, the individuals and organizations that we serve. And so, uh, you know, we use this to help encourage you to be a part of our vision as we keep building and moving forward. Thanks so much, Ellie. And, you know, as you so eloquently stated, partnership um, is so critical um, for, for our programs and services. So I'm looking at our time. So I'm going to skip our next question and really now turn it over to our audience um, to participate. So we're going to open the floor for a brief Q&A session. Um, so please feel free to ask questions related to the programs and services that our great panel has highlighted here, um, or the firsthand experiences that have been shared by our, our panelists by scanning the um, QR code that you now see on your screen. Um, this QR code is also going to allow you to participate in our contest um, because we like to keep things competitive here um, at the end of the webinar. So. We hope you're up for some friendly competition um, as well. The other thing you can do is type menti.com into um, your phone or internet browser and then enter the number shown on the screen, which is 3823-5584. And so um, we'll start seeing some questions um, pop up on the screen um, from our audience members. All right. So um, the first question I see here is, how do we help connect individuals um, who would benefit um, from your services? So um, do I have a volunteer, maybe Will, or um, someone want to take that question? Yeah, the best way to connect with, uh, I, I, at least with the hotline service and lifeline services, is um, get the word out and let people know that 988 is a reality. Um, so, um, even though 988 has been out since last summer, there's, there's a lot of people who don't know about 988. Um, much of the public is unaware of 988. So getting the word out and telling people who might benefit from the service, your loved ones who might know about it, who might, who might, you think might need it, let them know about 988. Um, let them know about, um, their local, um, hotline services as well. So they can reach out whenever they feel they need. I think that's the best way to reach out to, to hotline services and 988. And remember, it is chat, phone, and text. So if they're not comfortable with phone, they can certainly reach out by chat and text. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, you know, of course, um, 988 is not only a resource, um, you know, for those that are, might be in crisis or for looking to support someone who might be in crisis, but it's also a resource to just, you know, get access to other resources. And then, of course, if you want to connect with us, you can also always go to our website, everymind.org, um, to connect with us as well. So the next question um, I see here is, ah, it's for you, Will. Um, how do you keep yourself going and remain as healthy as you um continue to be as you do this work day in and day out, helping people through their deepest moments of despair? Um, if you ask 10 different counselors that question, you get 10 different answers. Yeah, I can um, imagine. So, but uh, I mean, generally speaking, to do to be on a hotline or the lifeline requires uh, a lot of resiliency, 
a good self care routine and and really just an excellent training regimen that goes into it. It's at every mind is no less than a month long, and it's intense training and it's necessary to be that long because this is challenging work. But more generally, I mean, but more personal to like my experience, what I personally see with my colleagues is uh, to help us get through is is there's a shared deep sense of of caring and compassion for others. Um, now I'm not saying that the only way to show caring is is by serving on the lifeline as a volunteer or staff member. But what I'm saying is to serve and be in people's darkest and worst moments requires a, a conviction, very strong conviction, not unlike like a firefighter going into a burning building. They, they to do that, you have to have a very strong conviction. And what is that conviction? That that by going into that building, you might save a life. The 988 service is no different. We're willing to get into people's worst moments because we we know that at the right moment, at the right time, we could possibly save a life. And so, um, you know, that, um, yeah, it's a life, we, we believe it's a life-saving service and we need as many allies as we can get to come alongside us to make this a, a continued reality. Absolutely, thank you, Will. And then um, next question, all right. Um, so it looks like Mariana, maybe this one is for you. What have you found to be the most challenging aspect of working as a therapist within the school system? I think for me, um, and I think with many of our therapists as well is, you know, post COVID, um, having the kids come back to school and, you know, sometimes, or at times, you know, with social skills and having virtual learning, um, yeah. that has been a little bit hard, um, you know, coming back to the school, um, in person, um, and also what also another thing that can be challenging is having the families come to the school, um, because due to work schedules, you know, our, some of our families work multiple jobs. Um, so having a little bit more engagement from the families can sometimes um, be a little bit challenging. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And it's so true, right? And after months and years of like isolation and virtual learning, it, it's been quite a quite a, a year, right? This past year coming. For sure. For so. sure. All right. Then um, do you have volunteer opportunities if you if we want to join in your mission? Um, absolutely. There are so many different ways to, to volunteer with Every Mind and to engage with us. Again, go to our website, everymind.org and become involved. There's a list of our volunteer opportunities there from you know, short-term or one-time support in supporting with, um, you know, giving drives for our school-based communities through back to school or holiday giving or um, supporting with our, the, we participate in the annual point in time count, um, uh, which is an annual count for our homeless neighbors. So there's opportunities to connect with us um, in a short-term or one-time way. And then can also, there are also long-term opportunities where you really are um, a volunteer that is part of our work course, um, you know, serving, let's say, as a friendly visitor volunteer, where um, the volunteers in our community are matched one-to-one -one with clients um, uh, who are age 60 and above, who are homebound, socially isolated, and lonely, and looking for friendship and companionship. So, um, you know, there's lots of ways to engage with us. We hope that you do. Um, and please go to our website to learn more. And I think maybe we have time for um, oh, great. All right. So we are running low on time. So we're going to move to the contest that I promised for those of us that are competitive um, in our audience. Um, so what we'd like to do is we have a contest related to the theme of our webinar this afternoon. So we're going to get ready to test your knowledge. So again, to participate, please scan the QR code that's on your screen or go to Menti and enter the number you see here again, which is 3823-5584. And so... Now we're, I think we have six questions total that will pop up here. And the quicker that you answer, the, the more points you get. So um, if we are ready, then let's have our first question pop up. Looks like we've got a lot of players. 44, awesome. All right, so question number one. I guess we're giving some time for more people to join. All right. So what number is the suicide and crisis lifeline? You've got 15 seconds. Oh, 
The choices are 911, 988, and 999. All right, looks like our audience is definitely paying attention and 39 people got it correct. It is 988, so way to go. Awesome. All right, let's get ready. All right, so we're gonna see our leaderboard. Um, looks like many of you got this question right and Eli was the first uh, to respond. So it was at the top of our leaderboard. All right, question number two. We've got a few more players who joined, which is great. I love competition. All right. How long has every mind been providing mental health services to the community? The options are 56 years, 46 years, or 66 years. Got about five more seconds to get your answer in. Great, all right, so the correct answer is 66 years. Um, and we have 21 folks who got that one right. So way to go. All right, so let's take a look at our leaderboard. Great, so it looks like we still have, <laughs> excuse me, Eli um, at the top of our leaderboard. So way to go, Eli. All right, question number three. I feel like a game show host. This is so fun. <laughs> what is homeless diversion? Is it preventing people from becoming homeless, which is option one, helping people who are already homeless, which is option two, or option three, which is advocating for legislation about homelessness? Ooh, that 15 seconds went really quickly. Excellent, though we had 30 people get that one correct. And absolutely, homeless diversion is work that we're doing to prevent people from becoming homeless and entering and preventing them from entering into our homeless system. So way to go. All right. Oh, looks like we might have... All right, so we've got a new leader at the top, Dan. All right. Sorry, Eli, but now Dan's on top. All right. So question uh, number four. Who is mental health first aid training intended for? Teachers or therapists or everyone? Let's see how many people get this one right. Way to go, that's absolutely correct. Mental health first aid is for everyone and anyone in our community can become trained in mental health first aid. So way to go. We've got a really awesome engaged audience here. So I love it. All right. So now through question four, it looks like Dan stays on top of our leaderboard. Question number five. Yeah. Why are school embedded mental health programs so essential? It's a great question. So to identify and address the needs of at-risk children and families, provide intensive case management and counseling, uh, to ensure mental health support isn't bound by economics or ethnicity or all of the above. Way to go, absolutely, all of the above. And that is uh, that is exactly what our school-based um, mental health services do is provide all of those services and everything um, in, in those options. So way to go, we had 29 people get that one correct. All right, so we've got a new leader at the top of our board, Finky. All right, way to go, Finky. It's amazing how close to running is. I know, right? <laughs> All right, so this is our final question. Who does our Serving Together program serve? One, service members, 
the family of service members, veterans, or all of the above? All right. Excellent. Absolutely. 34 people got that one correct. And it is all of the above. Our program, our Serving Together program, excuse me, supports and uh, service members, families, veterans, and, um, and their caregivers. So way to go, everyone. All right. So let's see who was our winner um, at the end of all six questions. going to be close. It is. Oh, looks like Thinky is our winner. So way to go. Congratulations, Thinky. Uh, great work. Um, and thank you to all of you for participating um, in our contest. So before we wrap up, I just want to briefly share a couple of post-event activities with you. First, we're going to send you a link to our website, which is a great entree point um, into learning more about Every Mind and how to become involved with us. Um, and there's various ways to support, partner, and engage with us in our mission. And then additionally, we highly value your feedback. So we'll be sending out a survey about this webinar and your thoughts on how to make partnership opportunities as easy and as accessible as possible. So your, uh, your input is really critical and valuable, and it'll help us improve and continue making a positive impact on this next year and, and for years to come. So Finally, as we conclude this webinar, I just want to remind you that your support is so crucial to our mission, and we're so honored to be doing this work in partnership with you, alongside with you, and we're so excited to continue working together to create lasting change. Um, thank you to my colleagues in this incredible um, panel of folks that have shared such inspiring and powerful stories on client and community impact that we have every single day. Thank you all so much. It's an honor and a privilege to work alongside with you every day. Thank you to everyone in our audience. It's been a pleasure. We hope that you have learned different ways to continue or to become involved with us. Thank you for your time, your participation, and support. Have a great afternoon, everyone.